Welcome to the idle chat where we uh, sit someone down in one of the appalling brown leather chairs that I've dragged around the UK uh, and we just get into the mind of a person that's relevant to the car world but you possibly don't know everything about them. This particular episode we're doing it live at the Manchester Tour event with my friend here Richard Porter um, and this is a friend of mine who, um, who I met before YouTube was a thing but he's become one of the most successful youtubers and he he shouts a lot but he also really does invent stuff and create solutions and uh, and also sets world records i'd like to introduce you to colin furs the man with the tie come on colin switched it on hang on the first rule of being a youtuber is the hardest bit is sound. That's my take home from working. Uh, I, I don't even have a, a lapel mic in my oh, videos. So I, can't, I can't concentrate on the video and know if the batteries are dead. No, I, well, I, neither can I. I've been down that road before and I've got home, like gone in to edit all the stuff and everything. There's just no sound. So I'm like, no, forget it. Just um, a top mic. Yeah. Keep it simple, Johnny. Keep it simple. Well, that, I mean, that, that's, that, I think that's something that uh, we, we should ask you straight away from the top. If... Um, you fell into YouTube, kind of. You didn't ever think this was going to be a career, did you? No, I was quite fortunate that when I first got onto the platform, November the 15th, 2006. Oh, so hang on a minute. It's, it's, that's it's not nearly fun. its birthday. It's nearly yeah. its birthday. That it was, I think the, the actual website had only been around for about a year. So wow. it, was, it was barely a thing. Um, so I got in it right at the start. There was no money in it. There was no AdSense program. Nobody was making a career out of it. I just did it because I used to make like VHS tapes of us doing stupid things. A little bit like the jackass stuff, but mixed yeah. in. Because I used to ride BMX, basically. And so I used to pass these videos around. And then somebody basically said, oh, there's this, there's this website now where you can upload clips. So I kind of chopped up some of those videos into small 100 megabyte size bits <laughs> and then would upload them onto the internet and anyone that's ever uploaded anything to the internet as soon as you get a little bit of like likes any positive feedback from it you kind of like ah oh, this is this is quite good i like this and you want to do it again and yeah. you know i am a, was a natural show off you know i used to like doing flatland at the bus station seeing people coming in on buses and they're like whoa look at this guys doing, doing tricks BMX on the BMX sort of thing. so it's just that but on, on your phone now yeah so and that's how I kind of stumbled into it and obviously as time went on YouTube got bigger you know my audience grew and then of course they introduced the ad sensing where you could start to earn money from and I remember like the first the first month or something that that come on I had earned like one dollar <laughs> twenty and then it was kind of a bit deflating because you're thinking oh do you know what I mean I was kind of open you know plumbing see you later boy that's I mean, it, because you were a plumber. Was a plumber. Your day job was a plumber. Yeah. So, but it took, it was probably a good three to four years before it started to get up to the point where it was like two or 300 pounds a month or something, which is still, you can't live off that. You can't quit your job yeah. or anything. But, um, but it was just slow progress. It's weird, isn't it, when you talk about it like that, it seems like an age ago. But I know what I wanted to talk to you about a bit more is your sort of car life, because I know you from living in the same town. Yes. Um, and I remember you with the, the, the Hilux, which I did a video on, talking about the indestructible Hilux that you've got, which is infamous in your videos. Still, still got the Lux. But, you, but your, you've, your, your car interest is quite unusual. You've got, like, you've got a BMW fetish. Got an old E30. There's a, there's a nice one over there, which is quite interesting, actually, because I noticed he's got F80 uh, seats in it, which is quite interesting. There it is. Isn't that yeah, that? the red one. The yeah. red one in the corner. Cause I, as soon as I looked in, I was like, they're not E30 seats. So... <laughs> first car ever was a 1.2 Vauxhall Nova. It wasn't all kevved up. It was, a, it was a lovely model. We got it from the local Sycamore garage. I think it was a trade-in from an old lady. And I had that for a year. But there was this one guy that actually, well, I don't think about it now, he lived round the corner from where I do now. And he had this, it was a D-badged 3 Series. It was a black one. It wasn't a sapphire black. It was a gloss black. And I used to see it going through town all the time. I used to look at it going, oh, I love that car. And then I was 
I was BMXing in the bus station and I saw it go past with a sale sign on it and I literally tanked after it as fast as I could. Caught up with him at Morrison's, which as you'll know is pretty decent. That's quite a long ride on, on BMX, a, that's a pretty decent bike. track. Yeah. Flagged him down, like, how much do you want for it? And at the time, it was a little bit more than I could afford, but I borrowed some money and basically bought it, and that was my first, my first E30. So. It's a proper car, you know, that's... It was a nice how car. How old were you then, did you say? Uh, 18. I was 18 when right. I got my first one. But the only thing is, you see, I love the shape of the cars, but that one, unfortunately, it was a 316, it was a four-cylinder one. Yeah. Which is not as, it's, they don't sound, they haven't got that six cylinder sound. Yeah. So I had that for about a year and a half and then I got the 325, which come from Saffron World. And, and you've still got a 325. Yeah, I still, it's not that one. That one I, I would still have today, but a very tired Colin. Um, we had a skate park built in, in the town and I used to kind of maintain it. And on this one Sunday morning, we were supposed to all go down and give it another lick of paint. And I'd overslept or something, and my phone had gone off, and Rick was like, where are you? You've got all the paint. So I literally jumped out of bed, jumped in the Hilux, backed off my mum's front garden, and there was a fence post in the back of the Hilux, which kind of stuck out the end. It couldn't quite fit a full fence post in it. It stuck out about a foot and about six inches the other way. And I went past the concrete lamppost. It pushed against the concrete lamppost, snapped it off at the base, and it just went smash straight across the A-pillars and just ripped the car off. No. So that was it. So I, I, you wrecked, I rode my own car off. Without being but, in it? Yeah. And I tried to tell the council that, oh, it must be frost damage <laughs> on the, uh, on the, on the, um, on the lamppost, but they weren't having none of it. You could see like this big chunk halfway up the lamppost that's been tucked out of it. So, um, I reluctantly, I kept it for a little while because I couldn't bear to get rid of it because I'd been everywhere in it. I'd, I'd been like touring around Europe and around the Nürburgring in it. And it was like, when I get things, I get so attached to stuff. I'm like, I'm not going to get rid of it. I will just maintain it forever. And like, just well, keep Well, you don't sell it. it. Famously, you don't sell anything. You don't, any of the builds on your YouTube channel, no. none of that's ever been sold. No. You're squirreling it all. So I'm, I am. There's going to be a, a, a room like this one day, maybe, the Colin Furs Emporium of Madness. <laughs> we we could it, all. it could be here at this. Well, you wanted it to be, yeah. but I've been digging and I haven't had enough time to bring it here. So with your projects and stuff, you know, I know there's been a lot of uh, world records. And when I first got to know about you, it was more about you were built a thing to set a record. It was less about knowing how, how it was built. It was just, you just appear with this mad contraption. I'm trying to remember the first one. Might have been the f- first, the, 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 first limousine, the limousine moped. No, the first one was the bonfire. Basically, I was getting a bit too old for the bike, for the BMX in. Not, not too old for it, but like all my other mates had, had stopped BMX in and I was essentially hanging around with kids, which at 26 <laughs> starts to look a bit weird sort of thing although looking back at it now 26 I remember kids probably didn't look any different but um, but at the time I was kind of like yeah this is you know it's just me left now and I kind of stopped doing that but the thing I missed with with the BMXing was there was always something new to learn always something to try you know go out and try and push yourself and normal life doesn't have that unless you put something in it so I was, on my, fancy I was on my dial-up, cruising the web, <laughs> and then I, I went onto the Guinness r- r- website for some reason, and I saw like world's biggest bonfire, and I thought, yes, that's Colin. I can have that, because I grew up next to a quarry, always used to like making fires, building dens and stuff, so I thought, right, world's biggest bonfire, that's got my name written on it. That was why the Hilux was bought, and then, so we collected all these pallets, they were all stacked in the field, roughly, where the fire was going to be, and then I had booked two weeks off work now I was going to stack them all up as high as I could to like proper you know make them as high as I possibly can and then about three weeks before the council rang up and they were like oh a minute we've heard you, you you're doing a bonfire which I told them like I'd given them a year's notice I'd rang Melton Borough Council up said I want to do this big fire what do I need to do and they basically said oh no it's all right just notify the fire brigade and all that and it'll be fine and like three weeks beforehand they all come over and like whoa you can't do this, what are you doing about parking? Like, sort of thing, is there going to be lighting on the road or anything? I was like, I don't know. I didn't think I didn't do anything with this. I was just, people can just turn up. So my event uh, organisation was not particularly good. So anyway, they nearly stopped me doing it, but I said, like, look, I've got 24,000 pallets in a field. There's going to be a fire. So it may as well be the world's biggest bonfire in a bigger heap. So they said, all right, then, you can, you can do it, sort of thing, but you're only supposed to have, like, 50 people there. So, but that was, that was problem one. 
Problem two was the farmer, like two weeks before, when he went to like cut the hedges and stuff in preparation for it, it was like, oh, Colin, I've just realised where you're building it, there's a high pressure gas main running under the field. You found one of them red poles, basically, in the hedge. So the two weeks I had booked off work wasn't spelt building it up, it was just spent moving it from one end of the field to another. 24,000. Yeah, so they were like being loaded onto the truck, shipped down. So if you ever look at any pictures of the world's biggest fire, it's sort of a little bit like anticlimactic because it's just a big square, whereas I wanted it to be like a huge pyramid that was like 40 metres high. Um, and it wasn't, it was just like a big block. It was quite boring, but that was because I had to move it. And now, some whatever it is, uh, yeah, 15 years later, you are doing these, you're building tunnels under your house. I remember when, I remember when Art, you phoned me and said, listen, could you just help me? I need some just, I need you to f- help me f- uh, drive alongside my Pulse jet powered cart just to check that it's okay. And the back of the seat was starting to glow and the local council or the police got called when you built the flamethrower moped yeah i got arrested for that did you get actually arrested yeah, got arrested for that but, on what charge uh well possession of a flamethrower is, pro- <laughs> is prohibited in british law um you need a section five firearms license which i now have so oh. <laughs> because well essentially because i it went in all the daily... It got in a lot of newspapers. Because years ago, if you did anything, it was quite easy to get in the papers. It's quite hard. It's a bit trickier for me now because I'm not, I'm not Joe Bloggs anymore, but equally I'm not mega famous. So, yeah. and if, you, know, so you don't just have to go to the shops wearing a weird hat. And it's like, oh, look, so-and-so's wearing a weird hat, <laughs> getting a newspaper. So it either has to be mega brilliant or you have to be like a, you know, yeah. just a normal, I'm a plumber, he made a flamethrower. That's, that's good. Yeah. But some of the newspapers badged it up as like, don't tailgate this guy, he'll torch your car. And then I think somebody had complained that was scared to go out in Stamford because of me what, on my the bike. man on the moped yeah, with the flamethrower. The man on the moped's going to get me. <laughs> so they come and arrested me. And it was really funny, actually, because the guy that arrested me um, I was his first ever arrest. He was shaking. He was like, you are the, the right to remain silent. And I started laughing. I'm like, I, surely I should be the nervous one. You're arresting me and you look more worried. Sort of thing. And it's kind of weird because I saw him a couple of years later like getting an Indian takeaway in, in the restaurant and he was all in with his mates. And I was like, wait, it's the guy that arrested me. And they were all like, wait. So let, um, let's talk vehicles because I know a lot of your builds are, are, are vehicles of some sort. And I mean, one of my personal favorites has been the, the Dodgem which actually ended up on Top Gear, didn't it? Yeah, that was, that was done to promote the new, the new Top Gear series. Vintage Dodge. It was, it was a CBR 600, um, squeezed. It was a lovely Dodge chassis. It was a 1963, I think it was. Um, was it Whittaker Brothers? Or it something? was. It was a Whittaker. Yeah, Whittaker I do Brothers like old Dodge And um, somebody had notified me of that years before, but I'd never... I never went and picked it up or anything because I'm like, I've got nowhere to put it. And then yeah. obviously this job turned up. And um, it was, I, I was still surprised now that I managed to get it all in the dodge because your feet like barely went round the side of it to get like to the brakes and the gear lever. There wasn't much room. So if Stig had been much taller, he would have, he would have struggled with it. I remember you talking to me about the build of it and Stig went out and did some fast driving in it and you thought it was just ultra slow and safe stig like took it out and he did like 70 in it but there was like a real grumbly patch in the in the rev range at about 7000 rpm and i kept saying i was like just rev it but slip the clutch like past it i was like once you get to about 10 it will it will take back off again and it will it like gets past it and he went out and he did like 70 come back and they had to keep like following with cars and stuff because all the health and safety was like complete nonsense and then I, and then I, so I said to him afterwards, like, Nonsense. can I have a go in it? Cause I want to know whether it's not running properly or, you know, yeah. or there's something wrong with it sort of thing. Is it, is it matey or is it just not working properly? And I got back in it and the guy that normally makes all their stuff was there and he, and he leant over to Rick and he goes, I think we're going to find out how fast this thing really goes now. And I literally just like bang, I did about 105 in it. And I was like, this thing's working fine. You just need to. You just need to do it. I was like, stop following him in the car and just let him, let him do it. So, and then that, anyway, it started hammering it down. So we, 
we 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 didn't do any more that day. But no, that was a that was a that was a fast machine that was. And it was actually reasonably stable at speed. I mean you couldn't do any corners or anything. But hundred I think hundred and ten point seven was the maximum I had out of it. That's very fast considering its dimensions. Mm. And, and were you bashing trying. people out of the way at that speed as well, or are they just yeah, yeah, yeah. oh yeah, totally. going around the wrong children way. and <laughs> going around the wrong way? There's no greater sin on a dodgem. I'm trying to think of like a leaderboard of pretty dangerous but interesting vehicles that you've done. I'd say near the top has to be the hover bike, because when I watched that, and you weren't wearing a helmet, and you were wearing a tie next to two propellers, yeah, I thought, what on earth? We've and you did actually hover it. The bike. It, t- t- tell, tell it. Just explain if you haven't seen this. It's pretty amazing. It's had several million views. Basi- basically, Ford wanted me to make something. Their uh, campaign at the time was, oh, I can't even remember it now. <laughs> something mobility <laughs> or whatever. Um, something about mobility. Something about mobility. And, and I kind of thought, well, like, those paramotors that you put on your back, I looked on the website, like 60, 70 kilos of thrust they put out, and I thought, Colin, I'm 80 kilos. Two of them will lift Colin facing the ground. And that literally was the concept. I sold it into them. Yeah. They spent 20 grand on propeller, on all the motors and everything. So I felt a bit of pressure because I'm like, this doesn't work. I mean, I've wasted a lot of their money. Yeah. And I did all the tests in the, in the, uh, in the shed with it trying to lift like, you know, kilograms of water so I knew if it you def- spun that up in your well, shed I had it in the shed no but your no. shed's are like about yeah yeah, yeah. wait, wait a minute John I'll finish the story All right. I had a bespoke made safety frame oh okay so okay. it had some rods basically that it just so it didn't wander off so it could like rise up and down in this little frame and I'd like just keep adding water I was like sat on the uh, on the bench so my legs were out the way so I'm sitting on the bench like revving it it's like making a horrendous noise going up so I thought yeah right it, it lifted didn't lift 70 kilos in the end, they lifted about 55 or something. So I thought, right, so I'm 80. I've got like 25 kilos to make a frame to bolt them all together. So I made this lovely aluminium frame. It was all very nice. Took it into the back garden. Literally didn't do anything. It just sounded Wah! So we had it chopping most of it off. Until it was like literally bare bones, just like two bits of 40 mil box. It was just like a curve, wasn't it? Like yeah, because really nice. one of them had to be upside down. Because you can't have to, if you have two propellers going the same way, you'll just end up spinning around in a crazy circle. Yeah. So one of them had to be upside down, and then we had to get propellers as well, which were a different, like left-handed, that were twisted in the other in the other direction because yeah. they were going backwards if, essentially. Yeah, you know, we, we we've got this we've got this situation where you know, engineering is in short supply. You want to keep children curious about how things are made, how to create solutions, and and doing hands-on stuff, using tools, being in a shed. Yeah, I suppose this is one of the the byproducts of it, which I didn't really think about when I first started. You know, when you're uploading stupid videos to the internet, you know, because it's fun, you don't think at some point that people will watch that and think, ah, that's really cool, I want to try and do that. And like... Because I've been doing it quite a long time now. I mean, like some of the people I've met today started watching me then when like 12. They've now finished engineering college and they're doing something they want. And it may have been, you know, my videos and some other people's that they started watching and that, that pushed them into that. So, I mean, that's, that's just a nice thing to know, really, isn't it? Because I never set out to do that. You know, I mean, originally, like I said, when I first started uploading the videos, it was not to, 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 to do anything in particular. It was just because it was fun. I know we talked about BMWs right at the beginning, um, and I know you've got a modern BMW right now. I do. So you've still got the E30 325? Yes, yeah, still got the 325 Sport. But you have the, the, the hot tub car. Yeah, we've got the E30 hot tub car. That's, that's at Tim's. That's getting in Tim's way at the minute. So that, and that's still ro- sort of road legal? <sighs> it's tricky, really. We filled it up with water, which obviously... <laughs> when you fill a car with water, we, we tried to seal all the electrics up as best as possible. We basically filled the whole thing up with fiberglass. But I believe it, I think it was the bubble bath that we used, which was the killer. What, is rotted? Somewhere? It's basically salt, bubble bath is. Oh. So salt, and that's done a lot, of, a lot of damage to certain things that were still metal-ish. And basically some of the water has creeped its way through. So I gave it to Tim. Tim Glover's like a local... Uh, local mechanic. He's the guy that did all of the work on my charger, actually. Yeah, and the Quite Lazy Boys garage, which, yeah. which was a TV show. Yeah. And I said to him, pull all the electrics out that we left in, and let's rewire them and redo them all underneath 
the tub sort of thing and then do it like that. But, but the problem is, you see, once you start working on other things, doing stuff on your old projects is, is not always the best use of your time. Are you, do, are, you, are you like a looking forward person? Because there's always another build. There's always another challenge. Yeah. People, you know, they're always going to want more stuff. And a video where you revisit or just do something slightly different to an older project, I don't, it's not, it, I don't know if that will, that will do as well as others, basically. Is it quite hard to top what you've done before? Like, the more you do, the more difficult it gets to raise the bar even further. Definitely, definitely. Things like the hover bike, hover bike and the bunker, nearly, I was like, what am I going to do now? I've made a flying machine and I've got an underground lair. <laughs> like, you know, it's, <laughs> what, what else do you do? Yeah. If, you're, um, if you were going to do a top five kind of leaderboard of, 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 of wheeled or motorised contraptions, what would that be like? World's fastest mobility scoot would be number one. It was, it was, uh, it was probably one of my favourite records because it just looks stock. CR125 engine it, so it's two strokes, sounded brilliant, didn't look any different, broke the national speed limit. So yeah, number one would be the scooter, probably then the Dodgem, because it was the fastest. And then probably the drift trikes. The drift trikes, if anyone out there wants to start and do a project with their kids, or if you're just not that, you know, not that capable of making stuff or whatever, it's a great first project because there's so many different ways you can make it. I've done electric ones. I've done ones where you don't need to use a welder. They're like bulletproof once you've made them. You know, you can't like flip them or anything like that. They're super strong and they're good fun. Like some things you can make, you know, I've made certain things. It's like, Really good, but they're not that practical. Well, most of them aren't that practical, not that really. Practical. Well, you can't make a hover bike at home. What are you <laughs> talking about? But they're, they're, re- they're cheap-ish sort of thing. Or if I've been talking to a guy earlier about it, it's the, re- it's the go-kart axle that's the, that could be the expensive bit because the pit bike engines, you get an old pit bike quite cheap. So, yeah, probably then the, uh, the drift trikes, then probably the hover bike, and then after that, vehicle-wise, this is where I forget what I've done. Tuk-tuk. That, Tuk-tuk. That, yeah, wasn't the... that a bit dangerous? I, I still don't know how fast that went because the, the runway that I had access to when I'd made the, I basically put a 600cc engine in a tuk-tuk, but it had no rear suspension and at 70 it would start to violently bounce. And I was only in third gear, so I've got another three gears. <laughs> so there is so much more potential in that, but it would, and like, it was the most unstable thing ever. The brakes on it were the original ones. They were just awful. So if I had a smooth... Thingy, but you just if you that thing gets in a speed wobble, you are you're finished. Yeah. You're so finished. Yeah. So, but um, what actually, is the worst that you've ever scared yourself? Um, we know how early when I said if you tell people about stuff, it makes it harder to back out. Three sixty swing. Oh my god! That was nothing to do with any sponsor. That was completely my idea, and. We basically, you, you buy lengths of steel, seven and a half meter lengths. So I'd then deliver to the house. Right, what's the biggest triangle we can make at seven and a half meters? So seven and a half meters is the longest bit of triangle. Made loads of them, stood it up. And it's like, you know how you lay a tent on the floor and you're like, well, that's not very big. <laughs> and then you put it up and get in it and you go, oh, it's really spacious in here. It was like that. We had these like triangles on the floor, stood them up. And I was like, whoa. And that's hard. That's the axle height. Like, I'm twice as high as that course, yeah, when I'm upside center. down. And we made that. It was supposed to have two poles down it, like a swing, but we just couldn't find a way of getting two poles up to it because it kind of. We made this winch system where you winched it up itself to build itself, but we could only do it with one. So then we had one pole which was ridiculously flimsy, and I put some like pegs on it and had a bit of a swing, and I was just like, "This is." This is a stupid idea. And I nearly backed out of it. You, you have I, to watch this video because it is, it's terrifying. I, I, I was, because you, you did it in your back garden. Did it in the back garden. Um, and, and it made your, it made it look like you were going. You were higher than the like house. When you were upside down, if you looked back, you could see over the house and up Hamble, and, and you up made the road. it all yourself. Yeah, totally. Brilliant. But, 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 because it was ridiculously wobbly, because it was supposed to be two. So it was kind of, when I say it was, it was engineered to be two, I, I made it thinking, well, if there's two of them, they'll be okay. So, but one of them was obviously a bit flimsy. Colin so Chapman would have been proud. <laughs> I'll just yeah. use less material and it'll move a bit. Simplify but... and then do a 360 swing. That's what he said. That's the thing. On the one hand, some of this stuff is really inspiring for people to, to dabble in engineering and, and experimentation and invention. And the other is, 
it's really quite dangerous. That, that was stupid. Wearing that, was. that so, doing stuff like that in your back garden, lots of non-helmet wearing. In fact, the wall of death. The wall of death was um, no, no helmets. Yeah, we, yeah, the wall of death was The clue no. is in the word death, by the way. Yeah, but you see, that. if you wear... There is some sense in that, though, because when you, when you go around a wall of death, because if you notice, the people that do it properly don't wear helmets either. True. Is when you're under that G, a helmet is bloody heavy. Sort of thing, and then this was <laughs> this was. I remember this. If you go and watch the video, there's a shot where all I just go is yeah, and I was supposed <laughs> to go up on the wall and like talk to the camera, couldn't do it. I could not concentrate on riding the bike and string ascendants together. So all that come out was yeah, <laughs> and um, we didn't. There was GoPros weren't around them days, and I remember trying to go up with the the Panasonic Handycam gaffer tape to my head. <laughs> At the side of my head. And I remember getting up and I was like, even the weight of the camera pushing on my head was like, I literally come straight down. I was you like, I can't do that. taped it to your head. I taped it to my head. This it was is... just awful. So, and I remember taking, because you, when you're on it, you don't feel like you're actually under much stress. And then I thought, oh, I'll, I'll take my feet off. And I literally moved my foot off the moped and it just <laughs> went bang straight onto the side of the wall. And it was like, duck, 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 duck. so I had to like pull that back on. And I was like, because you, I mean, you must be under one G plus, aren't you, to overcome, to overcome your, your, your weight. But I think I was under more because I had to go faster on that wall because it was so bumpy because it was made of pallets and scrap wood. So it wasn't smooth. This was pre-fire. This was after the fire. Oh, this was spare pallets. Because in the two weeks, I didn't have enough time to move all the pallets down the bottom of the field. So, so that's <laughs> when we ended up making the, the wall of death out of them. And that was like the first project where I filmed the building and the making of stuff. Because beforehand, I didn't really used to film the making of things. Like the world's fastest mobility scooter, it didn't have a build video. I just used to make them and then, and then film them working. But it wasn't until all the... There were so many questions like, how did you do that, how did you do that, that I started to document the building process. And that's where it kind of funneled off to become the channel that it is now, really. Because you still edit and film yourself, don't you? I do. I, I've tried, I've experimented with having somebody else edit, edit stuff, but I normally I'll film everything in the day and then I'll sit and edit it at night and I'll get a bit of a vibe as to where the video's going. You, you must have a considerable amount of energy in order to, I and mean, I've found YouTube to be actually quite exhausting and I've done a, only a fraction of what you've done. It is a lot of work. Um, it's kind of weird because like you, anybody that's ever done it will understand the amount of time you have to put into a video there'll be it's not just building the thing obviously the filming of it because i would sometimes wish i didn't have to film it i sometimes wish i could just go in the shed build the thing enjoy it and that's it and then just describe it yeah and then just you know just that that'll be it and i sort of i suppose that's what i used to do is just film the the thing using of it but of course people you know we all want to see how things are made and that's that's just as exciting but it is it is a lot but then, you know, you get the amount of opportunities, like, you know, Ford paid for me to make a stupid idea, essentially. You know, yeah. they bankrolled me, because I would have never have done that. I would have never have spent, you know, all that money on paramotor engines with that, you know, thinking, well, it might work, <laughs> sort of thing. So the amount of things, you know, the opportunities you get, you know, the places you can get to go and stuff like that, you know, just being here. <laughs>